All right, so hello everybody and thank you for joining us for this week's SEDS online webinar. My name is Chelsea Pedersen, if we haven't met yet, and today I'm coming to you from the University of Bochum in Germany. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors, the IAS, who help us provide all of this content free of charge. Uh, make sure and check out the website. There's tons of material there for teaching and research. Um, and there's lots of different avenues to get in touch with us. So, um, just another reminder that the coffee breaks, the SEDS Online coffee breaks are now back, um, back on. So if you want to attend any of those coffee breaks, you're open to whichever one works best for your schedule. So you don't have to stick to your region. Just find the one that you're interested in and um, yeah, click on the link. So today's lecture is by Dr. Amanda Owen, who is a lecturer in sedimentology at the University of Glasgow. Amanda received her PhD from Royal Holloway University before heading to the University of Aberdeen for a postdoc position. She's been at the University of Glasgow now since 2017. And her research primarily focuses on understanding both modern and ancient um, fluvial systems and their processes and products. Today, she's going to talk to us about various fluvial models and how they can produce uh, variability. And with that, Amanda, I will give you the mic and wish you luck. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so thanks to everyone who's uh, uh, completed this uh, little poll here that I've got going. Um, so I'll reveal the results of them and talk about them uh, afterwards. However, in terms of what I'm actually going to talk about, I'm going to be talking about fluvial models today. And I'm going to be concentrating on how much variability should we see and, and some lessons that we've learned from the Huesca and saltwash fluvial systems. Now, I'm the one giving this talk, but there's a lot of people and research behind this talk. Um, quite a lot of this work has been undertaken by uh, PhD students. So um, Alice Swan, but uh, also masters by research students, Ben Martin, and uh, other colleagues from around the world, uh, Adrian Hartley, Gary Wiseman, Gary Nichols, and uh, Richard Williams. So why do we need models? Um, as geoscientists, we are always working with missing data. So I kind of put a picture of a puzzle up there, and there are other, other, uh, other puzzles that you can have a look at, but this one's a nice geology focused one. And there are always going to be bits of that puzzle missing. No matter how good our outcrops are, there's, there's always going to be missing elements. So for example, this is a picture from uh, Northwest Scotland, uh, Torridon. And we can see that we've got quite a patchy outcrop here. It's quite small scale, it's quite heavily weathered, but it's still data. But our next data source may be far off in the distance, again, equally weathered, um, as well as battling those elements. We may be working with subsurface data like cores, where we're getting quite nice insights, but it depends on the core recovery um, and also how much, uh, how far away the different um, locations are in which we have data for. So it could be hundreds, if not kilometers away, that will get our next insight into the data. And even when we've got amazing outcrops, like we can see here, uh, this one is from Utah, we can see we've got a huge amount of outcrop here. This, this cliff's about 300 meters in height, but even in this superb uh, outcrop, we can still see, for example, down here, we've got some scree covering it, it's a little bit of missing data. And even if we went to the other side of the mesa, we're missing data in between these. And although this outcrop expands for kilometers, actually, it doesn't expand the whole system under which we wanted to study. So even with fantastic data sets, we are still working with missing data. And we can have fluvial models and fasces models, which kind of help us with this. And these models are generally synthesis of data. And we can have these in different forms. So for example, we can have uh, fasces models from sedimentary logs. So the classic braided channel deposit or the classic meandering channel deposit what that should look like in terms of a sedimentary log. But we can also have these kind of environmental depositional models. Uh, this is an example from Nichols and Fisher. And we can see in the proximal region, we kind of imply it's got large amalgamated sands. And as we go downstream, we lose those sands and we get these little ribbon channels. They are generally a synthesis of data. And they really do help us kind of guide our interpretations and set up hypotheses to help us understand this, the deposits that we're looking at. So if we go back to our puzzle, it's like having the front cover to help us understand all those different puzzle pieces. But they're kind of maybe in this instance is like the outline of the UK there. We don't know the specific details inside of it. So they're very much very helpful for us. 
So I'm going to be concentrating, uh, unsurprisingly, on talking about distributed fluvial systems and models relating to these systems. So distributed fluvial systems um, can otherwise be known as terminal fans, fluvial fans, humid fans, mega fans. I'm just using the term distributed fluvial system or DFS um, that encompasses all of those uh, different terms. And in 2010 and 2015, um, research kind of led by Gary Wiseman et al showed DFS to be really important components of modern sedimentary basins. And as sedimentary basins are areas in which we get accumulation, the idea is this is where we get better preservation. So therefore, the hypothesis is that DFS should compose a really important part of our geologic record. So I've got an example of a really nice DFS in here. Uh, this is from the Tarim Basin. And uh, we can see in here, this is our mountain region here. This is where the river would have been confined in the valley system. And then it hits the sedimentary basin in here and it's suddenly got area to kind of expand over. It's got, this one's got a nice radial pattern. And as we can see, we go downstream, it's no longer confined and it starts to bifurcate. And as a result of this, we get a decrease in channel size and presence as we go downstream. And we also kind of lose the transport capacity as we get that flow expansion. So we get a decrease in sand content as that material is deposited. The fluvial system will evolve around to kind of form up this radial pattern. Um, so we can see this portion of the system is active at the moment, but once it's deposited material, it then evolves over to the inactive side and then build up the stratigraphy there. But in that stratigraphy, we'll get increase in floodplain um, preservation as we move downstream. Because you can see we're over a wider area here, whereas in the more proximal region, the, the radius over which it evolves and migrates over is much smaller. So we're going to get a lot more reworking in comparison to the wider radius downstream. Now, in terms of going back to those models, we have a series of models that have been developed through time. So I've just picked up a couple here. There are other ones out there. So for example, the work um, Kelly and Olson, 1993, uh, then Nichols and Fisher, and then later on, um, this is work based on my PhD here. So we can see kind of how these have mo models have developed through time. And you can see that there's getting increasing more detail present. But how much variability is actually present? In terms of DFS, the generic trends are very well understood. And I've just talked about them, the decrease in channel size and presence downstream, increase in uh, floodplain content. And, and what's really great to see is these have started to be quantified in some instances. So the work uh, by Philip Hurst on the Huesca fluvial system, that was really fantastic work. It started to quantify the characteristics. So what were the thicknesses of the channel bodies? I then later did this with a saltwash fluvial system, and I've got an example of that work just up here. And then Wang et al. is another really great example from work from the Green River Formation as well. However, how much variability is present? Are these models kind of an oversimplification, or is it hiding how much variability do we actually have present in these? And this was something I was really quite interested in, um, in pursuing. Um, so for example, this is the work undertaken as my PhD project, each location is actually a single sedimentary lock. And then I would move kilometers, tens, hundreds of kilometers to go and look at the next site. And that's because this system was quite big and I wanted to get a system-wide coverage. But I'm really interested in how much variability we see. So we decided to undertake this work on the Huesca DFS in Spain. Um, now several DFS have already been mapped within this basin uh, alongside alluvial fans. Uh, so for those of you that don't know where it is, we're up in the northeast of Spain here. The basin is highlighted in yellow. And if we just zoom into this area here, these are two of the main systems. We've got the Huesca fluvial system here with radial paleo current direction coming out in these directions. And then we've got the smaller lunar system here. But I'm really going to be focusing on the Huesca fluvial system. Behind here, the external sea area. So this is the source area. And then we go out into the basin center um, as we move further south. Now, the deposits are Oligocene and Miocene in age, and they're part of the Sarinyenya formation. And the size of the system is about 70 kilometers apex to toe, so it's a pretty sizable system. And uh, Philip Hurst, uh, for his PhD work, uh, did a fantastic job of quantifying and mapping out the Huesca DFS, which really kind of accelerated our understanding of these uh, deposits. So in that respect, we already had a context to build on. We didn't have to go and get that initial framework because it was already there. 
And the other reason that we decided to go to this um, system is, as you can see from this image down here, that the outcrops are fantastic over a really good portion of the system. So it allows us to get those kind of system scale insights that um, we were looking for. So the aim of this work was really to build upon the work of Hearst um, from 1991. And what we really wanted to understand was what were the vertical trends in the Hoesca DFS? We wanted to understand if this system was prograding, building out into the basin, or whether it's retrograding, kind of um, building backwards, backfilling. And that's, got, that's really important to understand what was kind of going on at that period, but also how that might affect the characteristics through time and vertically through the sections. We want to understand how variable the characteristics are across the system. So in this schematic here, going from this point all the way down to the distal. And we wanted to understand um, statistics relating to channel presence, channel body and story thickness, as well as the grain size of the channel deposits kind of really testing those hypotheses of what DFS deposits um, look like. But we also wanted to understand what were the characteristics internally within this system. So for example, in the proximal region, how much variability do we get in those characteristics in the medial and then in the distal? And then also zooming in again, how much variability we would get at single sites. So there's many different layers in which we wanted to understand the variability in the characteristics. So why did we want to do this? This wasn't just an academic exercise. There's kind of practicalities behind this. So I kind of explained how DFS are thought to be important components of the subsurface. They've been they're known aquifers, uh, both modern and uh, ancient DFS deposits. They've been proven hydrocarbon reservoirs. They've got geothermal potential and they've got proven mineral deposits in them. So for example, uranium in the saltwash fluvial system. But they could be also really important as we kind of transition into greener energy sources and work towards sustainability development goals. So for example, they can be carbon capture and storage sites, um, as well as who knows the potential to be hydrogen storage sites. So there's real applications into understanding these deposits in 3D and how they may vary. So in terms of methods, this work was very much undertaken by Ben Martin. Uh, here he is down here working hard while I photograph him working hard. And uh, we took two approaches to this work. Um, so the first one was traditional field methods and we, look, we worked on eight sites. So this was Ben's uh, Matters by Research project. So it was still a sizable amount of work that he was doing. So at these um, sites, we took sedimentary logs, um, kind of decimeter scale, and we took a single log at each location, kind of trying to mimic how we would map out a system. Lots of photographs were taken and an architectural analysis alongside a Fachi's analysis was undertaken. But what we also had our, um, access to was a fantastic array of uh, virtual outcrop models. And these are really thanks to um, Safari Consortium as well as V3Geo. And some of these outcrops are on V3Geo um, for you to all have a look at in your own time. They're fantastic outcrops, so I do encourage you to do so. And what we did with these outcrop models um, was we created pseudo logs. And what I mean by that is what Ben did is he went in, and this is an example, it's kind of an amphitheater style exposure, is we can kind of create pseudo sedimentary logs. We can't go in and get details like grain size and sedimentary structures as well. Um, it's kind of below the um, resolution of the outcrop, but what we were able to map out and log was floodplain deposits, channel deposits, and internally we could get to the bar scale in terms of resolution. So we could still create these really nice sedimentary logs, just not in the same detail that we would have in the field. However, what we were able to do was generate a lot more logs than we would have time to do in the field because of the ease and the speed at which we can do it. So Ben measured up a whole bunch of sections across these five sites. And at each site, he kept a the same distance between the logs across the system so that we weren't getting more data from kind of a smaller outcrop compared to another. There was always a consistent spacing. So in terms of these uh, virtual outcrop models, so we had five of these um, and also allowed a really comprehensive architectural analysis because we could see things in 3D. So just going back to the map here, we can see that the green locations in here, these are the ones we've got field data and virtual outcrop models for. And then the purple ones just here, here, and here, they are the ones that um, we just have field data for. So um, we've got a mixture of data sets here. So 
Um, just to make sure we're all happy with the terminology I'm going to start using, um, I'm going to be talking about channel bodies and story surfaces. So this is a modern image of a river system here on a DFS, and we can see the active river here meandering nicely uh, across this plain here. But what this red arrow is showing is the area over which it's migrating, and, and this is the channel belt. Now through time, the meander will migrate and form a channel body um, in the subsurface, and then it will evolve, do the same, yeah, migrate, amalgamate, and form a channel body. So that is what I mean when I say the word channel body. In terms of a story surface, as that me, um, river system migrates um, amongst its own kind of deposits, it can cut into its previous deposits. So this diagram here is really trying to show that. We've got the active channel in here, and this red line shows it's cutting into its previous deposits, but kind of like a small scale incision surface. Now, these story surfaces can scale to a single bar deposit, or they can contain several uh, bar deposits. So this is actually a snapshot from that virtual outcrop model, just to highlight that. The yellow is depicting where the channel body is, and these are generally quite laterally extensive. The red surfaces are the story surfaces in here, and then we can see lateral accretion uh, surfaces in blue relating to the bar deposits. So moving forward, a little bit of context is needed for the Huesca system. Now, as with many fluvial systems, we don't have a datum across the field area. So we need to kind of, we don't really have that understanding of where things are sitting in terms of the stratigraphy, what stratigraphic height. Now, most of the deposits, they have a very low dip, the, the system, the deposits, very low dip, less than two degrees. And there appears to be a lack of faults between these sections, um, which the geology maps of the area kind of um, back up. We do have the Barbastro anticline, but that is a kind of much further um, north in the proximal regions and don't appear to be affecting the sites that we are studying. Now, a key thing that we want to understand is where the apex point is. Where's the dispersion point? Where does this system start? And in 1987, um, Peter Jupp worked with um, Philip and Gary Nichols to try and work out where the apex of the systems were. And the Huesca system had quite a low confidence in terms of the result that it turned out. Um, but what we've been able to do, and I've done further work with uh, Peter recently, um, and we've been able to kind of computationally start to predict where the apex positions are, is Ben looked at reevaluating this kind of interpretation. And he also incorporated really important um, mapping from the proximal kind of uh, feeder zone system up here, uh, the work done by Vincent Elliott. And Ben kind of redefined where the apex is. And um, you can go into a lot more detail on that uh, in the paper, but just to kind of give you that context. And, and what this allowed us to do is actually look at the distance downstream. So there is a slight change from the original one, um, but broadly things are fairly similar. So in terms of what the deposits look like, I'm not going to go into too much detail for this because there's a plethora of it, literature from the Ebro uh, Basin and the Huesca system on this, but we broadly got two types of deposits. Uh, here's Ben working away again while I photograph him working. So we have these big large scale channel deposits in here, and these can be amalgamated with kind of story surfaces coming through them. Internally, we can see nice trough crops bedding, horizontal lamination, all the kind of usual suspects for fluvial deposits. You can also get quite isolated, smaller scale channels. Um, so this is a really nice example of canal section that you're all kind of probably quite familiar with, but we can see really lovely bar scale features in here as well. We also have floodplain deposits, which we can see at the base here. And these are composed of um, splay sheet deposits. We also see nice kind of splay ribbon channels, which we see in here. And we see a lot of paleosols as well. So in terms of the fasces present, they're kind of uh, your standard fluvial fasces that are present. In the very, very distal end, we do have some kind of lacustrine sequences, which the fan kind of terminates and interacts with uh, through time. So the first thing we need to understand is, do we have any kind of system scale progradation or retrogradation of the system? So Ben mapped the vertical trends. Um, so what he did is logged log height on the Y axis, on the X axis, we've got channel body thickness. And these pie charts just relate to the dominant geometry of those deposits, um, which I'm not gonna get into for this talk. Um, but 
what Ben found was we could see a prograde in signature. So this is one where we should see more proximal fasces through time. So bigger channels. We could see that at Petusa, Monthon and Balea. So this Petusa, Monthon and Balea. Now I am fully aware there are only two data points there. Um, so in terms of a wide data set, it is not. However, that's because at that outcrop and at that part of the system, we're in the real distal end of the system. That's all the channels that are there. Um, so it's not due to a lack of data collection. That's just the minor amount of channels we see in that portion of the system. So we still need to take that with a pinch of salt. In terms of a retrograding, so backstepping signature, uh, we only see that at one outcrop, which is Siena. And, and this is in the distal portion of the system. All other sections are fairly random. So for example, if we look at Monte Aragon here, we can see uh, things are kind of jumping up and around in between, no systematic increase or decrease in channel sizes as we go up section. But what we can see is we've got a lot of local noise, um, particularly in the medial locality. So these localities that sit in the middle of the system here. What we also found is there's no pattern that is dominant within a particular portion of the stratigraphy. So we were able to just broadly map the GPS point where we were in terms of height and that broadly related due to the low dip in the area of where we were sitting in the stratigraphy. And whether we were more at the base or the middle or the upper portion of the exposed part of the system, it didn't matter, there was no dominant pattern. So what that allowed us to do is actually go forward and look at the statistical data for this system and go with confidence by saying we had no large scale allocyclic system scale progradation or retrogradation. So in terms of um, the field, we can see those downstream trends that I've discussed. We can see these large amalgamated channel bodies in the proximal region. As we go into the medial region, that those channel deposits become increasingly separated and compartmentalized uh, by floodplain deposits. Then we get down into the distal where we just get these small little ribbon channels and successions dominated by floodplain. And this is um, contrary to the previous work done in the area by, for example, Phil Hurst, and, but also on other systems. This is where things uh, really start to get interesting. So what we did um, was we tried to collect a lot of statistical data. The way that we, in which we sedimentary logged, everything was then put in spreadsheets and mapped up all the characteristics for all the sites. So channel body percentage versus distance downstream. So this is literally what the next growth is at the outcrops. We can see that there's a really nice clear downstream trend. So uh, R squared 0.89. You can't really argue with that data set. There's a clear clustering of data in the different zones of the DFS. Now, how I've determined whether something's proximal, medial, or distal uh, is based on a whole range of characteristics, but largely the architecture that we can see in these outcrops. And it's probably worth mentioning that we only dealt with really large scale outcrops in which we could see the channel recurrence coming back at least three or four times so that we knew that we weren't just dealing uh, with a small portion of the stratigraphy. But we can see really nice trends there. Now, I've just highlighted this uh, gray site here, which is um, Monte Aragon. And we can see that considering it's like the third, uh, the, the site third downstream, it's actually got one of the more lower values, but nothing to worry about too much. It's still clustering within that medial zone. Then we looked at the channel body thickness, and we have obviously have a lot more data for this um, because there's several channel bodies at each site. So Ben was able to map out the maximum, the minimums, and the averages, and Q3, Q2, and all that kind of stuff. And again, we can see that there is a downstream decrease in channel thickness, so the R squared is for the average value at each site. But what we can see is we get a huge range of values present at each site, and particularly in the proximal region, we can see that we're getting as high as 20 meter channels down to uh, about five meter channel bodies. Over in the distal, they're really kind of minor and there's not much variability. What we're starting to see though, is we're getting overlap in the data between the proximal, medial and distal sites. The, medial, uh, the distal and the proximal are not overlapping, but that medial zone is overlapping with those two zones. In Monte Aragon, um, relatively low value considering where it is in terms of the distance downstream. Then we looked at the story thicknesses, um, so that's kind of the incisional surfaces, and downstream trends again are present. The average, um, the R squared is 0.88. That's a fairly good one. 
However, the overlap really starts to increase and we're even starting to see our kind of lower values overlap with our distal data sets. Generally speaking, our larger values are found in the more proximal to uh, the most proximal sites and they generally, the smaller values are found in the distal, but that's not a golden rule. As we can see, we can start to overlap. Again, just gonna highlight uh, Monte Aragon in there. Uh, not so much of an issue in this data set, it seems to be sitting within the norm. And then we looked at the weighted average grain size for the channel. So what we mean by weighted average grain size, and this is detailed in more in Ben's paper, is basically if we have a five metre channel, that's fine, fine sand, but then we have a 50 metre channel that is conglomerate, we take that into consideration. Again, we can see a really nice downstream trend, but we do have a couple of anomalies up here. And Monte Aragon really is an anomaly up here. It's really coarse grain for its location in the system. So it just seems to be kind of a repeated outlier that keeps appearing. Now we can look at the virtual outcrop model. So we, in terms of number of sites, we have less sites, but at each site we have more than one sedimentary log. We have these pseudo logs and we can have anywhere between five and 30 logs at each location, depending on the size of the outcrop. Now for the channel percentage, we can see again, really nice downstream trend. Uh, so the red lines in here, let's know the field average, uh, the white lines are the pseudo log average. So we can start to see how the data sets compare. But similarly with the field data set, we see a downstream decrease in channel presence and we've got very clear clustering across the different zones with no overlap. Then we look at the channel body thickness and we get a really large range in values here. We've basically got a lot more data. Uh, largest range is in the proximal and the range does tend to decrease as we go downstream, but there is a lot of overlap between those different zones on the system. The story data set, it's only when you look at the average values that we do actually see a downstream trend. Um, so that's looking at kind of the white lines that are in the boxes here. And you can see that they can be quite variable compared to the field data sets, uh, but I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later on. Again, there is that downstream trend, but look at the overlap here. We've got really large range in overlap. And when we start looking at that, we're not so confident that we can pick out the proximal medial to distal zones. So just to quickly compare the field and the virtual outcrop data sets, all the same downstream trends are observed. Um, we do get a big variance at Carathis. Um, so in here is where we get the most variation between the two data sets. But generally speaking, the virtual outcrop model, we do get thicker channel bodies. Um, for the stories, um, they're fairly similar and some are slightly bigger in the virtual outcrop, some are slightly bigger from the field data set. What is interesting is we do actually get a stronger correlation in the field data set. But when we look at the data and we can see the overlap and the wide ranges in the vertical outcrop model, basically field outcrop data, less data, less noise. What we're picking up in that virtual outcrop model is that we've got a lot more data, but even considering that and the more noise that we've got present, those downstream trends are very much present. So just to bring some thoughts together in terms of the Huesca system, clear proximal to distal trends, and this is in line with, for example, the work of Philip Hurst in 1991. Vertical trends, we've got no systematic um, big scale progradation or retrogradation, but we've got very clear variability present. Now in the proximal area, I'm gonna pick out a few of these. The channel body thicknesses did vary considerably. So I just want to have a look at this and kind of think about why that's the case. So this is just an example of the most proximal data set, uh, Petusa. And, and what we can see here is the outline of the channel bodies. And we can see, depending on where we are, uh, where we take our logs. So, for example, in here, we're going to get much larger, thicker bodies where there's a high amount of amalgamation occurring. But if we, for example, take a log over here, we're just kind of getting on the edge of those channel bodies. Uh, they're not amalgamated. They're just kind of single stories over here. So that's why we're getting this big range. It's because the high degree of fairly random amalgamation. It's usually generally quite blanket amalgamation, but there are going to be areas in which aren't amalgamated. And that results in this big variation in channel body sizes. Now, in terms of the channel percentage in the medial zone, this zone is really interesting. We get those huge ranges occurring. And what Ben's done up here is kind of put a panel together of all the logs. So he's got 20 logs going across here. Yellow is channel 
and brown and gray are floodplain deposits. And because we've got extensive um, outcrop in channel bodies, then could actually trace these out and see what's happening. So I'm just going to kind of focus in on this one in here. We can see we've got quite a large um, channel body deposit here, but as we move laterally, it starts to split out. And this means again that in some areas, some logs clip the very edge of those channels, uh, whereas some logs will clip the points, um, clip the points at which we get amalgamation of the different channel bodies. And that results in this kind of big variation that we see, particularly in the medial zone. And that's not so prevalent in the proximal and distal zone, because in the proximal zone, although we do get varying amounts of amalgamation, it's generally much more amalgamated with smaller pockets of floodplain. In the medial zone, we've got more substantial floodplain deposits, whereas in the distal zone, we've just got those small scale channels uh, surrounded by a lot of floodplain. So although there will be variations as we clip those channels um, or not clip them, it's not to the same extent and kind of uh, to the same degree of amalgamation change that we see in the medial zone. Now that Monte Aragon site is a consistent outlier. Now, obviously we've got spatial data here and then we're plotting it on a simple XY graph. And that data point is all taken from the valve here. And then we kind of measure the downstream distance assuming a radial pattern. And this is why Monte Aragon starts to come up as a problem because although most of the flow in the main kind of trunk channel will obviously be going down here, the Huesca system is really quite radial in nature. So Monte Aragon, although it is fairly close to the basin margin, it's kind of way off to the side. So we think it takes quite an extreme event to avulse the channel and pin it up against the basin margin. But when it does, that's why we get coarser material kind of delivered in here. There's also small scale alluvial fans that have been mapped along here um, to, by Gary Nichols. Um, so it, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they are also contributing some kind of material into those very kind of basin margin locations. So that's the Huesca system. That's all great. We've studied a lot and churned out a lot of statistics and um, analyzed the data set quite a lot for this one system. But what about other systems? This is one system. If we're looking at generic models, we need to build these on more than just one um, system. So we're going back to the saltwash DFS, the place I did my PhD. And this work that Ben did kind of made me realize is maybe we can start looking at other systems in the same way. So it's part of the late Jurassic Morrison formation. So the formation is older in age. However, it's substantially larger so it was deposited over an area of about 100,000 kilometers squared. So an area bigger than Scotland. Now I mapped this system out for my PhD and the flow was coming down here from the Southwest going generally up to the Northeast. And we can see here, this is a channel plot, a uh, percentage of channels, which have just contoured up. We can see a general decrease as we go to the distal end, very much like the Huesca fluvial system. Floodplain, similarly increases as we go downstream. And this blue one is just the Lacustrine deposits, which are kind of on the fringes of the system. Now, it's a very similar climate and tectonic setting to the Huesca DFS, which makes it a really nice one to compare with. But again, that difference in size is substantial. So from the estimated apex, using that statistical method that I talked about for the Huesca system, we can approximate where that apex is situated and the results for that came out with pretty good mathematical confidence. Now from the proximal area right down to the distal, it's about 550 kilometers in length, whereas the Huesca was 70 kilometers. There's a really big difference in size there. And the other main difference is the salt wash is evidently prograding into the basin, which is kind of the work I did from a PhD in mapping out that progradation. It's really system scale, large scale progradation. So same downstream trends in terms of the architecture. Um, we have more proximal sites exposed in the salt wash. So we've got even more extreme amalgamation as we go further up section. Um, so this scheme, the, the green is picking up the floodplain deposits here. And as you can see, they're really minor components. We go into the medial and those channel deposits become increasingly separated by floodplain. And then we go to the distal and we get small little ribbon channels. So very much the same as the Huesca system. So looking at the channel percentage, so we had eight outcrop locations uh, for the Huesca system, but for the saltwash fluvial system, uh, we have 27 locations. We've got a lot more data. So when we look at the channel percentage, we can, again, we can see that downstream trend. It's a really nice trend, but we're starting to see a little bit more overlap in that data. 
We've got a lot more data, but that trend is very much still present. Now, we do actually have a couple of outcrop models available to us, and this work was undertaken by uh, Alistair Swan as part of his PhD um, in Aberdeen. And Alistair looked at three locations, so Tutor in Canyon, which is located about here, Atkinson Creek, which is located around here, and then Little Park, which is just here. So we got broadly proximal, medial, and distal localities. Now, because we're much more proximal, we're not actually seeing that overlap in the data at all. Atkinson Creek, the medial and the distal localities, again, we're starting to see that overlap in the data. So we're not seeing that clear separation like we did on the Huesca fluvial system. And in, in the distal, we're seeing a lot more variation as well. And what we can actually see on the salt wash is we do seem to have these kind of larger scale trunk channels coming down the system, particularly in the distal end. It's more amalgamated up section and harder to see, but we can see we've got these kind of more axial kind of through fair systems on this distributed fluvial system. So the larger sizes are clipping kind of those uh, trunk panels. Now, there's a lot of complication going on in this graph. Um, so I also looked at the channel body and story data set from my, my PhD data set. So the orange dots are depicting the maximums, the blue is the average, and the gray are the minimums. So just concentrating on the blues, we can again see we've got a broad downstream trend, but it's nowhere near as clear as it was in the Huesca fluvial system. And again, we've got a huge amount of variability. So I just wanted to kind of highlight to you that if we cover those up and we just look at the proximal data set and we just look at the distal, we can see, yes, we've got those clear end members. That is that medial zone again, where things get really messy, a lot of overlap with both zones, and it's not its own distinctive kind of um, zonation or clustering of data. And we see exactly the same with the story data set, and if anything, to a worse extent, um, which kind of mirrors what we were seeing with the Huesca, where the trends were less apparent in the story data set, um, but even less so with the salt wash data set. So how do these two systems compare? And uh, the beauty with these systems is that we've kind of statistically estimated where that apex is. And we know roughly where the systems terminate or terminate either into a lake or into kind of uh, an axial system in the basin. So that means that we can normalize the x axis. We can put distance downstream rather than having kilometers, we can put it percentage downstream. And, and this is what that data looks like. So there are similarities um, when we compare the two systems. As I said, this is for the channel percentage comparison. We see that downstream decrease in channel presence. However, those trends are much more apparent in the green data set, which is the quest fluvial system, whereas the, the salt wash seems to be a little bit more smeared out. However, the values for both of those systems do fall within each other. So it's not like we're seeing substantially higher values in the salt wash or substantially lower values in the Huesca. They are sitting all together kind of within a broad cluster. Widest range again in the medial zone, but in the proximal and the distal zone, sorry, the salt wash channels are on average a little bit, um, they're more prevalent in the salt wash system. And I'll talk about why that might be the case soon. So looking at the channel body thickness comparison, uh, proximal, medial, distal, generally speaking, the Huesca channel bodies are thinner, but still sitting within the salt wash kind of lower end values. And in terms of the story thickness comparison, yes, overall, the Huesca system stories are thinner, but they are sitting kind of more comfortably within the, the salt wash range. So the trends are more apparent in the Huesca DFS. Um, and there could be several reasons for this. The first one could be the Huesca system's got a much more radial pattern than the salt wash fluvial system. Salt wash is quite elongated, and there are other systems either side that it's competing with. Whereas the Huesca fluvial system doesn't have that kind of same um, lateral confinement with other systems. You can see it it's got a really nice radial pattern all the way out to the basin margin. The other difference is the Huesca seems to be quite aggradational. We talked about it doesn't have any system scale progradation or retrogradation, whereas the salt watch clearly is progradational. Uh, I think that is why the Huesca system has more apparent trends is that salt wash Although we can see these clear proximal, medial, and distal zones, those zones kind of get smeared out down system, particularly towards the top as it's starting to prograde into the basin. So that's why that one kind of um, isn't as clear or as strong a trend as it is in the Huesca system. 
But considering their differences, so there is about 480 kilometer size difference here, they are remarkably similar. Channel bodies and stories are smaller in the Huesca, but still fall in the range of the salt wash. And actually the point at which you place the zones are very, very similar. So we, we kind of define them being proximal, medial, or distal based on the overall architectures of the deposits in line with, for example, the grain size and things like that. We use a whole range of different age sets. And, and I plotted up where the proximal medial zone would be for both of these systems, and they kind of fall within five to 10% of each other. They're really, really similar, which I think is quite incredible that we've got these very different size systems, but yet once we normalize the data, it really shows that potentially we've got quite a robust scalable model here. But it's that medial zone. In both of these systems, it can be highly variable. And it really is about where we're getting that transition in terms of highly amalgamated deposits to those kind of very isolated, um, no amalgamation of the deposits. So what are the drivers of all of these kind of trends that we're seeing? So changes in accommodation to sediment supply re regime. I've talked about a system scale, salt wash is prograding. So the sediment supply is much higher in terms of the accommodation creation rate. But we do have a lot of autocyclic noise present. But we don't have any systematic progradation or retrogradation in the Huesca, but lots of autocyclic noise. So we can't pin those kind of variabilities present down to those because they're different for each of the system. But what we can think about is the fact that the medial zone is this transition between the very local accommodation to sediment supply regime. So if we look at this diagram here, this is where our sediment input is coming in. That's where our sediment supply is very high. As we go downstream, we lose material due to decrease in transport capacity. So our sediment supply is much lower in the distal realm. And we're in this kind of transitional zone in here where we're potentially starting to see the, the accommodation and sediment supply rates kind of start to balance out ever so slightly. And that could be why we're seeing such different variabilities there. So all we need is slight fluctuations um, between these two to kind of bring out those uh, variabilities that we see present. And is the location, location on the system something that we need to consider? I talked about Monte Aragon being a distinctive outlier in the data set for the Huesca system. And that's actually located on the basin margin over here. Now with all of that data, we measured straight lines going out from a point, but we didn't really consider where on that radius it was. So we, that's something that may be actually kind of bringing out those variabilities. We may find the central axes of the system has less variability um, compared to kind of the wider fringes of the system. So that's something that we kind of need to take into consideration. And again, it's that kind of lateral confinement. If we look at these systems in here, we've got a series of DFS coming from this mountain region and we can see we've got that kind of lateral confinement. And the differences that that may cause in terms of the medial zone where it's trying to expand out and sometimes it can't, maybe we have this system occasionally imposing on this one, that's going to start interfering with the system and therefore bring about the wider range in statistics that we see. Not so prevalent in the proximal and in the distal, everything's quite small scale, wider area to evolve over. So I was quite interested in understanding these variabilities. And this is really, really kind of recent work um, that I'm doing with Adrian Hartley. And what we wanted to look at is whether we could see at the local scale discharge variations. I've talked about large scale changes and whether we see them or not. But actually at a small scale, autocyclic scale, can we see anything? So what we've been able to do is actually estimate the discharge for a number of sites on the salt wash. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details of how we did this. Uh, this is work in progress to be submitted imminently once we kind of finish off the paper. But what we've been able to do is estimate the discharge for a series of bars across the system. And again, we see that nice downstream trend. So I'm just gonna focus on the average for all bars. We can see that nice downstream trend, but we are seeing, again, that variability that is present. And that variability isn't consistent in terms of where we're sitting in the geography. So again, those kind of local scale discharge variations may be driving the variations that then translate into channel size and also into the, um, how much we amalgamate something, depending on how much sediment supply we've got locally going into that area. But we also need to start looking at about how variable our modern systems. and, and Actually, we've got a PhD studentship who will be kind of starting on this quite soon, who's um, going to be characterising the modern systems. And we've also got a PhD student here at Glasgow, Dan Juma, who is busy starting to characterise and draw out statistics from these modern systems. 
this is very much our watch this space because we can learn a whole lot from understanding of these modern systems and mirroring that with our um, data set from the rock record. And also insights from modeling. Um, so this is work um, being undertaken by Suyad uh, Worms up in Aberdeen. This, this work is actually uh, currently in review. So again, it's kind of watch this space, but the process style modeling for modern stratigraphic modeling, they can all give us really important insights. We're always looking at the finished product when we look in the rock record, but this gives us um, an avenue to play around with accommodation and sediment supply and see how that affects the architecture and the statistics in terms of the characteristics and the variabilities that we see within the systems. So some take home points. Downstream trends are apparent at BFS and the more that we quantify that, the more robustly that trend comes through. However, we do have large degrees of variability. So that model is a simplification and maybe sometimes hides how much variability that we do get across the different BFS zones. The medial zone is particularly troublesome. Uh, we get overlap with proximal and distal data, but we also get large ranges in there as well. So we're not just kind of clipping those data sets, we, we are going well into the ranges that we see in the proximal and distal zone. The zone at which we see that separation of channel body deposits, that medial zone, is actually a really important part of the system to understand because that's where we start to get real reservoir compartmentalization and work that we kind of looked at looking at where the uranium is really shows that that, that kind of internal heterogeneity is critical in terms of internal barriers and the potential for where we store it those barriers can be good things uh, can also be bad if we're trying to extract out if we're relying on connectivity between sandstone bodies so don't just use one data point and try and infer where you are in the system. It's not as simple as that. This, this work shows that we need several data points to start being sure. Now, in terms of which data set to take forward, which is the most robust one, it's channel percentage. This looks the most robust characteristic as we look across the different systems. So virtual outcrop models have been really valuable in gaining insights into the variability, the speed at which Ben could collect data from multiple outcrops and not have to worry about scrambling up vertical cliffs and, and things like that means we can collect huge amount of data. However, we need to be careful because we do still need to get those field observations for that detailed observation and validation um, of this work. So going back to those fluvial models, are they useful? Absolutely, they are. If we go back to the puzzle. I'd rather we have the outline of the UK than nothing at all to help us kind of put that puzzle together. But what our models need to do is start kind of, we need to keep developing. We need to capture and embrace the variability. And that, the reason for that is it'll actually give us insights into what are controlling the deposits. What are the, what are the factors that influence how variable that model should be? So I talked about we've got two systems fully quantified where we know the apex position. But we need more examples from different climate and tectonic settings because that will start to give us insights into what controls the architecture of these deposits and the in internal characteristics. So hopefully, you know, if people are out there sat on this kind of data, please do get in touch because it's producing these kind of quantified generic models that really increase our understanding of these systems. So uh, just going back to uh, this poll, I'm just going to have a look. So just in the last minute or so, if anyone wants to have another quick stab at that, please do. So just go to slido.com. Meeting code is 68836. And the reason I was quite interested in this is to understand uh, different people's perceptions. Um, so this is actually an outcrop that we have quantified. I was interested to see what the variability was in terms of what people perceived the net growth to be. So I'm going to switch over to the results now of this one. And OK, so most people think the net growth is about 60 to 70, uh, 50 to 60 follows 40 to 50. And I can actually say you've all grossly overestimated it. So the range that we actually quantified from, I think, about 25 logs here was um, 54 to 17%. And the average was actually 37%. So even in this kind of little quick thought experiment, it's really clear how much variability we've got, not only in our perceptions, but in terms of actual hard quantified data. So uh, I'm going to stop talking there. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that great talk. Um, I especially liked seeing those little sliders of, <laughs> of the QR code question. Uh, 
go up and down as you're describing the results. So you guys, please um, start typing your questions into the chat now. It is open. You can send them please to everybody so that we all have access to um, your great questions. And then we will go from there. Um, so I had some definitely saved up for you, Amanda, but it looks like people are already, already at it. So let's just get going. Um, our first question is from Howard and we want to know if there is a downstream change in fluvial style, such as braided to meandering in either salt wash or cuesta. Yes, absolutely. Um, so in the salt wash, we do see that transition. Um, the, what was interesting with the salt wash is actually being traditionally interpreted to be braided. Um, however, we have a nice paper led by Adrian Hartley in 2015 that showed actually the system is um, quite dominantly meandering. We can see these exhumed meander bars. It's absolutely fantastic. You should definitely have a look at that paper and see them on Google Earth. Now, in terms of the, the salt wash, yes, we do see it, but it, the, only the very, very proximal are braided. On the Huesca, it is dominantly meandering again, but again, those most proximal sites, we start to see hints of it having a more braided palm form. In terms of modern systems, that's where it's much more evident. We can see a braided to meandering transition as we go from the high sediment supply, we lose that sediment supply, things kind of get shallower. So we see that transition from kind of braided to meandering and then off to kind of single thread channels. So yeah, we do see that. It's not something we were quite able to quantify uh, within Ben's project. Um, it was just one year masters. He did an amazing job, but had to draw the line somewhere. Yeah, that's impressive. Um, okay, yeah, and also please guys, uh, don't forget to tell us where you are coming from. Uh, okay, our next question is from Sarah Giles from New York City. Great talk. I'm wondering what insights your work might provide for distinguishing the origin, the submarine versus fluvial, of Proterozoic channel systems. Um, yeah, that's quite interesting. I'm, I'm not so up to date on the submarine channel. I'm not quite sure what angle that's kind of asking at, but whether we can distinguish submarine from fluvial um, through these techniques in terms of channel percentage and um, how that changes downstream, I would expect similar trends on submarine fans, so it may not help. Um, again, that apex estimation method, it's not being tried yet on these uh, marine systems, to my knowledge, it would be fantastic to have a look and then see how we can move that into the submarine realm. But it's not something I've looked at, um, so I'm not quite sure of the answer to it yet. Um, in terms of how we distinguish them, my gut feeling is just based on net degrowths, it could be quite difficult um, to do. That yeah, makes sense. Okay, lots of comments about um, nice presentation. And our next question is from Max Deckman, who is coming from the University of Georgia. He wants to know if you have ever encountered upper flow regime structures in any of the DFS you've worked on. Yes, uh, yeah, we can see them for sure. So we can see, um, I haven't quantified where they are exactly on the system, um, but certainly in the salt wash, which is the one that I personally worked a lot more, we can see those upper flow regime structures. So kind of fairly shallow, quite fast flowing, um, flow um, horizontal laminations that kind of extend over the bars and further and beyond. So yeah, the, that's the insights we're trying to get with that discharge work is understanding the variabilities in the flow and the discharge within the system, because that's really important in terms of understanding the sedimentology and the variability. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we are seeing those variabilities, absolutely. Um, but we're just working on that data set and trying to clarify that up um, in terms of how much variability we see very much a watch this space we're working on it as much as we can during the pandemic yeah so another thing to watch out for yeah. the nice uh, theories to sort of be tested out and, and tried and hopefully published so everybody keep an eye out um okay while we wait for more questions i'm going to um, give you one of my own so my question or one of my questions really lies in what you think the difference in variability would be if using or comparing pseudo logs with measured sedimentological logs? Yeah, so I think the main difference is the pseudo logs, they give us a straight kind of view of what's happening. When we're logging, we're having to crawl our way up a log outcrop. Mm -hmm. It's very rarely just a straight line. Sure. Sometimes that is due to the outcrop exposure. Sometimes it's because you can't climb up a cliff without equipment and climbing skills. So I think that's why we are seeing slight biases in the field data is because we're trying, we can't just go up the section. Whereas with the, the 
but to our crop data set, we can, we can just kind of put a straight line through and that makes it kind of more comparable to wireline and core logs that kind of go straight down. Yeah. Um, so that, that variability is quite interesting to see. The reason why we get so much variability in that virtual outcrop models is we are just, we just have so much more data. Right. And the averages still fall within very similar ranges. We're not seeing any drastic differences, but they are very much, it's more data, it's more noise, but that's exactly what we want to see. Yeah. Um, it's how much things vary. How representative are those single field logs against 25 virtual outcrop logs? Yeah, it would be interesting maybe to, to take a look at, um, maybe not then a, an actual outcrop uh, log, but a core log and comparing yes. that to a virtual or a pseudo log yeah. and just seeing the difference in terms of uh, model variability. Um, okay, but I'll stop because there are more questions now. Um, Valentin from Oslo says, excellent presentation. Um, I miss going, <laughs> he misses going to Utah. Yes, me too. Yeah, don't we all, yeah. <laughs> Always nice to see photos from there. My question is, do you think that the variability in the data, um, your medial part, linked to the various styles of fluvial systems across the middle area? Uh, yeah. Um, the variability in the data, yeah, linked to those different styles of systems. No, I, I don't think so. Um, and the reason for that is that we, for that salt wash system, we've actually been able to map the meanders over a huge area. Um, so right from the proximal medial boundary, we can see it and we do see evidence for them in, in the proximal, but we just don't have the um, satellite imagery because of just the exposure style. Um, so that's, it could be a play in it. And I think the, de the degree in which you have migration is the key bit and amalgamation of subsurface previous deposits is what's driving that. Obviously the meandering ones are gonna migrate quite a bit and so it could be slightly driving it, but the thing is, is it looks like the meandering plan form is fairly consistent through those zones. So I don't think it's a driver in causing those changes and the huge variabilities. I think it's more to do with subtle variations in sediment supply and accommodation that then drive the differences in amalgamation that we see across it. That's what we're really seeing is causing those variations. And, and that, that might be why in the proximal region, everything's kind of going for it large scale or everything's flowing in, everything's being reworked, whereas the medial zone is where it starts to try and sort itself out a little bit and start to behave. And then sometimes it's clipping a, another one and other times it's not. And that's why we see those variabilities. Again, those slight variations in discharge may be causing more amalgamation as it kind of cuts in, which we don't actually recognize in the proximal because it's just all amalgamated. Okay, um, our next question is from John from UNC. He wants to know what criteria you use to recognize the salt wash in the most distal settings. Oh, um, cool. near Gunnison, Colorado. Yeah, so a um, whole range of criteria. So um, we, we looked at previous maps uh, of the system, but also the stratigraphic context. We looked at the provenance of the systems as well. So we always knew where we were sitting in terms of the, the stratigraphy. Now there it's sitting on top of nonconformity. It's really, really interesting. Um, but we, we tried to use the, the wide scale strat to kind of constrain ourselves. We knew where kind of uh, the, the stratigraphy above was sitting. So it was kind of process of elimination that we got to be in at that point. Um, so that's, that's how we determined that one. I, to double check my thesis for even more details, but um, I remember that outcrop because we had to get a boat to it along the river. Um, but it's, yeah, we basically use a large scale stratigraphy and just make sure our provenance was still the same and because we see different provenance coming in slightly from other systems. Um, it's much, much thinner there, of course, as it kind of goes over that high. Sure. All right, our next question is from Adriano from um, Rio, uh, Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. And thank you, Amanda, fantastic as always. And what about this basin scale characteriz uh, characterization is not so spectacular outcrops. Is it possible to obtain similar results? Oh, that's a great question. That's kind of like, how many locations do you need to be sure that you're looking at DFS? Sure. Um, so oh, in a nutshell, we need to make sure that we're seeing downstream trends um, that are consistent. So in a tributary system, we should expect the opposite because we've got additional drainage coming into those channels. We're splitting it. So we need to make sure that we're seeing those downstream decreases. We need to make sure we're seeing the changes in amalgamation. So if you have three sites, I'd be like, okay, it's a working hypothesis, but we need a few more. 
So we actually did try and test this in the Bitcoin Basin, which work on my postdoc, and we were able to actually start mapping that out and be confident that we were on certain systems. But yeah, I, you need a good handful of data to be sure. I wouldn't want to put a number on it because it depends how clear your data is. Some systems three, may be more variable due to the climate or specific subsidence regime in the area. So yeah, um, I'm not yet putting a number on that. But the more systems we quantify and the more range that we capture, the better idea we can have of that when using sparse data sets like Wireline or Core Data. Absolutely. All right, our next question comes from Saiful from Jakarta. He wants to know if auto cyclic, um, if auto cyclic is really noise, or if there's a good portion of order in those um, auto cyclic. Oh yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so I'm sure when we first uh, looked at those progradational cycles for the salt watch, um, not to the same extent on the Huesca system, um, but there does they it does seem to be a little bit of order present in terms of the salt wash, because we can see that kind of general increase, but the way it ranges away from that kind of increase up section can vary considerably depending on where you are in the system. So in terms of order, yes, we can see the order in that we get repeated evolution cycles, but there are subtle differences between the evolution cycles that may be due to slight variations in the climate or the discharge or the sediment supply coming into the system that brings about kind of that disorder. So, I've not quantified that um, and I don't have a hard answer, but I think there is order in there, but not to the kind of uh, the degree of, for example, the stories. Okay, our next question is from Jorge from University of Manchester. Do you see any tectonic influence in the development of those study cases that could change in some way the stacking patterns or are the models considering a stable setting during deposition? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So for, for the Huesca, um, we do have ongoing tectonic activity um, as the fallen basin develops. Now, that's part of the reason that we look at those vertical trends, because if we get a decrease in accommodation um, due to tectonic activity or an increase, we should see that with the system responding in terms of how much amalgamation we get, um, how much channel pres preservation we get, and how all these different things coming in. So in the Huesca, we don't see evidence for it at that particular point. However, in the salt watch, we think that's what's actually driving the progradation with very early um, stage fallen basin development. Um, as it starts to kind of that severe fallen basin starts to form that's more uh, prolific in the Cretaceous. So we think that's what's driving the overall system scale progradation of the salt. Okay. Um, so our next question is from Kazuma from Japan. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Can DFS develop in arid climates? And do you have any idea how to interpret the effects of climate variability in terms of channel size or evolution frequency. So yes, absolutely. We see them in all climate zones, uh, humid, temperate, polar, arid, warm, arid. We see them all across the whole thing. And what we might see is a difference in size, um, largely due to water availability, but absolutely they're prevalent throughout. In terms of how we affect the climate variability in terms of channel size and evolution frequency, that's where we need more data. Um, in terms of rock record, we've only got a handful of them um, that we quantify data and that we can then normalize against each other. So we need more data to be able to do that. Now, there are differences, for example, um, in a more kind of flashy discharge um, regime, we've got high fl fluctuations, we can hypothesize that we might see more evolutions. Um, as we kind of get rapid deposition and then the next one kind of has to divert around that. So we might see those um, scales, but I mean, that's kind of why we're looking at modeling work, uh, which is why it is undertaken, see how we can change those to understand differences in the evolution styles and what that means in terms of the deposit characteristics. Yeah. Okay, our next question is from Maureen from University of Geneva. Thank you, Amanda, for your presentation. What are the time spans of those DFS deposits? Are they similar for the, both systems? Yes. Um, so the, the, the Huesca system is over a much kind of smaller time interval. So it's a Ligocene, Miocene kind of age, whereas the salt wash is late Jurassic in age. So you've got a fair few more million years on top of it. Now, the difference with the Huesca system is we're only actually seeing a small exposed portion. The system is much older but those deposits are way down in the subsurface. In terms of what we're seeing, it's kind of um, not necessarily the top because a lot of that's been removed um, as the Ebro Basin in size when it connects up with the sea. 
um, it kind of drove a lot of um, my uh, nick point migration up and erosion of the landscape. That's why we have such great outcrops of it. But it is um, deposited over a smaller time scale than the salt wash. Okay. Um, so our next question is from Carol from both Poland and Wales. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Is there any change in the floodplain type deposits in different zones of DFS, paleosol types, drainage degree, presence of calcretes, etc.? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that work, we there's actually a paper in the paleosol SEPM 2013, uh, one by Adrian Hartley, one by Gary Nichols, and we do see that. Um, so we do see this change in the, the type of paleosols or soils that we see on modern systems as well as in the ancient. Um, so that's been documented. So for example, in the salt wash, we see in the proximal kind of better drained uh, paleosols. And as we go out into the distal and we kind of hit the water table, that's where we see the more poorly drained paleosols. And you can actually see that even in terms of how people use modern DFS in terms of their crops. We see different crops being grown on different portions of the DFS in relation to those. So we've got more sandy substrate um, in the floodplain deposits, more proximal, so it's better well drained. Whereas in the distal, we've got less sand, kind of more mud rich, more poorly drained as we start interacting with the water table. So yeah, absolutely we see that, which is really cool. We don't see it so much on the on the Wesker system though. Um, but it's so dependent on local variations as well. Um, what the local climate is, what the local water table is doing and all these things. But um, there are a couple of papers that document that downstream trend yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is um, Marik. You say more data, more noise, but how about a part of the system which actually is characterized by lots of noise? I can see a risk of getting a model that is too ideal for a system that is not. Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure I fully under, quite understand the question, but I think I do. So, um, so you say there's a risk of getting a model that is too ideal. Um, and I agree with that, um, but that's why we want to test how ideal this model is. So that's why we started quantifying these trends. It's really important that we have this generic model, um, but we want to start quantifying certain characteristics on that. So we're trying to look at, for example, how much the sandstone percentage or the net growth varies. And if there is variation, why is that? And that's why we want to strike out into very different DFS. Look at a very arid one. Like I said, these two are similar tectonic, similar climate settings. So we want to branch out, you know, look at a very humid one. Look at one in a polar climate. Look at, the, they're both fallen basins, different size, but, you know, look at an extension or strike slip. Is that where we see it? Because I think, I think what you're saying is correct. Like, yeah, we can see noise, but that noise is telling us something about processes involved um, and the controls on the system. So I agree, I don't want to like, I think it's important that our models show the range that is possible in those characteristics um, so that we're aware of not over-interpreting the simplified models. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like you actually are creating a lot more data and um, looking at various systems and it does inherently create more noise when there's more variability um, inherently in the systems, but just to better refine those models and maybe create new or different models. Sounds like. Um, okay, so once again from Sarah Giles in New York City, um, how might you expect dynamic topography uh, to influence the proximal, medial, and distal trends that you observed? Oh, a lot, absolutely. So I'm talking about examples here where we may have kind of blind thrust coming through in the most proximal regions or that kind of tectonic um, influence there. But yeah, if you put a salt diaper somewhere, it's going to absolutely change the dynamic and influence where the system goes. And we can see that on modern systems um, where we get certain structures come through that kind of start diverting the river. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, so for example, the Chinle formation, um, we see huge, like that really massively influences the fluvial stratigraphy. Um, so, uh, you know, people like Nigel Mountney and, um, a whole bunch of other people have kind of done work on that and can demonstrate that. So absolutely, I would expect that to change it. So if, for example, you're in the medial zone and you suddenly get salt diapers and that confines the system, you're going to get more amalgamation as it squeezes in. So absolutely, we're talking about an area in which doesn't have that kind of influence at the moment. Let's, let's start with uh, no massive changes and then kind of look into those complications. But yes, I would expect changes to happen. And we documented that for, for fluvial systems, we other people. 
Um, so once again from Merrick from Krakow, Poland, um, there were many and thick in inferred floodplain intervals in the correlated logs. Have these inferred intervals been included in the quantitative analysis? Yes, um, but only when we're sure that laterally there is floodplain deposits. So again, that's an exposure style issue, and that's where it'd be interesting to compare with, for example, wireline or um, core data where you've not got that issue. It's where we've got screed slopes, but we can see floodplain either side. And that exposure style guides our interpretation because you can see in a lot of outcrops where the sandstones are, we get like big cliff style exposures where the mud is, that's where we get the gentler slopes. So yes, we have got inferred bits in there, but those inferred bits are backed up by kind of what's in and around that specific log um, and bringing that in. So only used within when you have um, confidence yeah. within context. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so um, if you have any last questions, you can type them into the chat now. Um, I will give a quick announcement that EGU SSP division is looking for a social media coordinator to join their division committee. So if you're interested in taking on that role or just learning more about it, please contact Stephen Lokier. Um, you can uh, reach out to him via his personal email or also through the SEDS online email address um, that you can find on our website. And next week, we will have Doric Stowe, who is going to be talking to us about the contrite turbidite controversy. So please join us again next week for another great talk. And Amanda, thank you again. Um, oh, thank you for having me. Wonderful. So yeah, thank you for everything you, you're all doing. It's keeping us going through the pandemic. So thank you. Yeah, we are happy to do it. All right, everybody, have a great week.